Hi, I'm Jonathan Ferguson, Keeper of Firearms and Artillery, and I'm here with a flintlock rocket launcher, and this is Up in Arms. Now, when I first joined the Royal Armouries back in 2009, one of the first things I saw as I was led around the stores like a child in a candy store was against one wall, a row of bizarre, wacky firearms, although there was more to it than that. Several of them, um, I think it pointed out to me, were in fact rocket launchers. Flintlock rocket launchers. Now, as an enthusiast of all firearms from throughout history, as well as, of course, popular culture, those of you who have <laughs> seen me before will know that, the idea of a Georgian RPG-7 sparked all sorts of um, amazing thoughts in my head. And since then, I have uh, regularly wondered what the heck these were made for, why there are so many, why they're all different. Every single one is different. You can get a hint of this if you have a look on our collections online system, by the way. Flintlock rocket launcher, and you'll, you'll get a, a few old pictures, unfortunately. Nothing, nothing too great on, you know, the variety that we have. So, um, spoiler alert, we don't know. We don't know what these were made for. We don't know precisely when. All we know is that they were in the Tower of London stores at some point, um, probably immediately after they were finished with. So what we can do is take a look at this thing, try to read the object and, and get a sense for, for what this really is. Now, as I've mentioned, we have a number of them. Some are more like shoulder-fired muskets or, or whatever than others. Some are really wacky looking. Some have a straight through tube. This, this is a launch tube, not a barrel. Some have it continue all the way out, poking out the back, and you fire it over the shoulder, even more like an RPG-7. I've gone with this one because it's intact, so we can get a good read for, for how it would have worked. Um, and going, going from the front to the rear, it has this feature intact as well. Only two, two of these things still have sights. That's what this is. So uh, one has a folding sort of ladder-ish type sight. This is a, a, a grooved ramp. And if I can try to demonstrate what I mean, this thing is going to go off camera. But at this sort of angle, so perhaps more shallow than you might think, basically your sighting groove is aligned with, well, the sky. Some of these launchers are, have big stands, bipods essentially, uh, implying that they were for launching at a, at a fairly extreme angle, which is, fits more the, the, uh, you know, our uh, imagination in terms of artillery rockets. These would be miniature artillery rockets. But a couple of them, notably this one, that very shallow angle on that front sight, bearing in mind this thing has been bent slightly upward as well, so it would have been even more shallow, now this, this actually tells us something, this very shallow angle between sighting system and launch tube and buttstock tells us that this is for engaging on a, on a flat trajectory, flattish trajectory. So just enough elevation to help against gravity, um, not to try and loft this thing uh, very long ranges as an artillery bursting munition or warhead launcher and not definitely not, I think it's safe to say, a signaling apparatus, which is the other obvious use for a lightweight shoulder-fired rocket launcher at this time. Uh, communication across distance on a battlefield at that time is a huge problem, and the ability to launch uh, ideally colored uh, signal devices would be quite attractive. But in this case, at the least, you are, I'm pretty certain, engaging infantry, cavalry, artillery, depending on how far they, they might be. I don't think this would have a tremendous range. I can't really say how long, unfortunately. So yeah, this, this, is, this is for point targets, I think. So the barrel is actually sheet copper, and that's one of the main reasons we know that this isn't a conventional firearm. It's not for firing lead balls of 0.95 of an inch, by the way, is what the caliber of this is. It's not for firing shot. A sheet copper barrel would just burst immediately if you try to shoot anything bearing any real pressure. No, this is a launch tube. And despite the stock cover here, I don't know if you can see, but this goes all the way back to just above the trigger. 
that's a cover, and I, we can't get this open. We should x-ray it, actually. That's a good idea. Um, there's a smaller diameter tube continuing all the way back to here. Uh, no further than that. Some of them, it does continue on. So whereas some of these things um, are getting fired over the shoulder, like we do later on, uh, Panzerfaust, RPG-7, that kind of thing, um, this is very much shoulder fired with a conventional musket style buttstock. Incidentally, the shape of this is quite modern. This is more akin to something like a new land pattern musket, which might be indicative of, of the date of this thing. Um, so it's, it's up at an angle, getting my sight. Well, the sight is aligned automatically by me putting my cheek on the stock effectively, but it's inevitably going to be at a minimum angle of about that, so somewhat shallow. Trigger is back here with a sort of bull, bullpup style connecting rod. And we can see if I gently put that on half cock. Yep, that works. So the connecting rod is in there and functional. So a bit like a bullpup, but this is, this is a reverse bullpup. It's like a reverse stretch affair. So instead of putting the mechanism behind the trigger to shorten the weapon, we've put the trigger further behind the mechanism to elongate it. And that has to be to give the rocket uh, munition that's loaded down the barrel enough time to burn, to build up sufficient momentum to, to be cleared out of, the, out of the barrel, if that makes sense. We don't know what the, this munition would have looked like. Um, you're probably picturing something like an RPG-7 warhead if you're a fan of the modern firearms. We really don't know, unfortunately. Uh, it's also, it's been, it has been bent slightly. I don't know if you can see that, sadly. Cra uh, there's a repair to the stock there underneath. And there is a bend to the tube. So I think this has been slightly restored, but it's pretty intact. Perhaps the best way to sum up how this thing works is a shoulder-fired bottle rocket launcher. <laughs> so just like putting a, a rocket on a stick in a milk bottle and lighting the blue touch paper, and standing well back, well, you can't stand well back. You can only stand back this far <laughs> from where all the fire and, and uh, launching is going on. So conventional lock, of course, with a pan full of powder will start burning through to what we'd normally call the breech. Um, doesn't actually have a breech. It has a closed tube inside the stock and so you would, you would experience a little bit of recoil as the pressure build, well, a bit of pressure builds, but it's not really about pressure. It's about the rocket exhaust launching itself. Rockets are their own propulsion. Um, any buildup of pressure in here is pretty much incidental. I hope, hope that makes sense. So it's flashing through to, the, to, to this middle, almost middle point of the barrel. No, more like the rear two thirds, actually. Barrel, launch tube. That's then igniting the equivalent of the blue touch paper. There would presumably then be a delay. I don't know. They could have made this a, a pretty quick ignition, actually, given the, the arrangement of it. And then whoosh goes the rocket out of the end of the tube, and someone could reload it for you, and you could carry on. We should say we can't be 100% sure that these are for offensive rocket purpose, purposes. This could, in fact, be a signaling apparatus. Um, but given the variety, size, shape, weight of, of some of them, uh, some of them are pretty heavy duty. At least some of these things, I'm pretty convinced, are offensive for exactly the purpose you would think. Explosive rockets um, going down range and doing damage to the enemy. Now, a, so as little as we know, and that's essentially it, there is an interesting connection with another part of the, of the collection that I've literally just discovered working with my colleagues on this series, which is... The lock on this, which is a pistol lock, it's not a tower lock. It's not, not Board of Ordnance. It's not got a, a cipher on it or anything. It's simply marked a lock or Alec, which would be the lock maker's name. Can't find him in the records. So well, we assume it's a him. There were, in fact, um, female gun makers as well. Um, yeah, don't know who that is, uh, it, it's, but it's a standard type of lock seemingly, or at least they bought a batch from some gun maker called um, ALOC, and they are on some other fascinating combination weapons in the collection, which are lances with guns built into them. So not rocket launchers, but 
similar similar sort of configuration, sort of um, de facto staff weapons. <laughs> I mean, this isn't a staff weapon, but it's long enough to be one. The lances obviously are staff weapon, and they have these locks built into them as well. So there must have been some fascinating trials going on, probably at the Tower of London, but we don't really, well, not the launching, obviously, <laughs> but the, uh, the, probably the setting up of these weapons would have happened at the Tower, presumably. We don't really know. And then where the trials were done, what, what they en encompassed, who initiated them, what for, we really don't know. Our only touchstone here are the uh, Congreve and Hales rockets, of a, uh, well, famous for uh, their use in the, in the Napoleonic period and later on uh, in the 1850s, uh, depending on which type you're looking at. Artillery rockets, though, those were somewhat comfortable with. Um, these appear to be an attempt to miniaturize that technology and turn it into an infantry weapon. Clearly that went nowhere for a good couple of hundred years because well, we know nothing about them, and nobody else seems to have tried it. I haven't seen this in any other national or, or any other collection around the world. It seems to be a British thing. If you know otherwise, please do let me know. Nobody goes looking for things that they don't know exist. So, <laughs> a fascinating piece of kit. What are your thoughts? Um, you know, have you come across the gun maker A-lock or lock maker? Um, have you seen a flintlock rocket, or a percussion for that matter, rocket launcher anywhere? The best I can offer date-wise is maybe about 1820 to 30, based on the uh, type of locks that are fitted to these things. Um, there is one with a percussion lock, for example, so it's possible that these trials went on from, well, who knows, until perhaps the 1830s. This is, I think, one of many things in this collection that is well before its time. So. I always think of the, the stereotypical mad inventor in a shed, although in, in this case, we really don't know. But someone with a, a potentially genius idea, but the world isn't ready for it. So <laughs> in this case, although we can't, you know, normally I'd be telling you, um, well, there were trials and they thought it was rubbish. And then 50 to 100 to 200 years later, someone does something similar. In this case, the link is just not there. All we can do is look at pioneering stuff like the German Panzerfaust and Panzer Schreck, uh, which as I'm sure a lot of you know, is only coming into use in the 1940s. So, you know, significantly later than this thing. And without doubt, the inventors of those things had no clue that someone had already had a go back in circa 1820 to 30, something like that. Pretty fascinating. The same ideas will come around again. And that's what happened. And they, those became, with blips like the infamous British uh, Piat, which was actually a lot better than people think, uh, for launching explosives at distance. Um, whereas grenade launchers were a thing basically from the 17th century all the way through to the present with a few, few gaps. Rocket launchers or infantry rocket launchers went away entirely and then came back in a different country a lot of years later. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for watching. Um, as you know, we are a charity here at the Royal Armouries Museum. If you'd like to donate to us, there's a, a link to the website to do that. Um, the best thing you can do for us is to come and visit us if you possibly can. Um, and if not, to check out our various social media outlets, um, you can find all the links via the website um, or in the description. And we'll see you again on Up in Arms another time.